So thank you very much, Padmavadra, for doing this question and answer session, mm -hmm. part two. Um, do you have anything you'd like to say before we start? Any... Um, well, no, just to say what I said yesterday, that I'm really glad to be uh, doing this question and answer session with you for the, for the Berlin Sangha, particularly the English-speaking uh, group, because I feel a very strong connection with, mm. with that group of people and with Berlin generally. And uh, just to reiterate that um, it's very important for us here to feel connected with people throughout the world, especially in the Sangha. Um, you know, like I said yesterday, we've got really good conditions here and, um, you know, we're aware that other people have, uh, you know, really difficult conditions. So if we can support in whatever way we can, uh, we will. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So should we just jump straight in? Yes, do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the first question is from Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Sarah. <laughs> and she asks, um, what is, in Buddhist philosophy, what we call the higher power in a 12-step program, for example? There is a very wise, friendly and unconditional love voice that sometimes clearly talks to me and helps me become 100% calm, clear and self-responsible. It's a blessing when it happens as it's pure love speaking through me. But I was wondering what the Dharma has to say about that. Uh, well, first of all, it's it's really good that um, you do have such a, a loving voice uh, speaking to you, that you feel in touch with that with that higher power, and that 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 is really supporting you and uh, uh, encouraging you, and 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 so on. And uh, I think I said yesterday when I was talking about how to deal with negative mental states about internalizing. The spiritual friend, you know, we have spiritual friends who, in 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 life, who who help us and encourage us. It's it's good to imagine them talking to us. Mm. You know, I have uh, friends of mine, much to my astonishment, who who will say to me that sometimes they hear me talking to them about uh, how they might approach a particular uh, set of circumstances, and they, you know, there'll be other people that they bring to mind to help. You know, to help them and encourage them. I think that's very, very positive. I think uh, I, I think it's really important to do things like that. And in Buddhist tradition, I'm sitting in a, a shrine room, and you can see some of them here, Sarah, on the on the wall here, filled with Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. These are all uh, images which are evoking uh, the enlightened consciousness. You know, the full well, not the full because that's infinite, but the, the, the vast array of enlightened qualities, and they all have different forms, they bring out different aspects, the, these, this different imagery. And uh, in Buddhist practice, a very important part of Buddhist practice is puja and devotion, and indeed meditation upon these forms. And these would be, as it were, the higher power. Uh, they 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 uh, crystallize and embody uh, the enlightened uh, consciousness, and ultimately, of course, uh, they are uh, not apart from us, as it were. They're, they're, you could even say some traditions would say they're deep within uh, consciousness, um, not in a psychological sense, but in a profoundly spiritual. Uh, sense they're not at all mundane in that way, um, but but uh, it can be very hard for us to relate to enlightenment because it is so vast and it is so beyond our, our ordinary comp comprehension. It's hard to think of it as something as it were inside us. So this is why we have all these figures mm -hmm. so that we can, as it were, relate to that higher consciousness. And when you meditate on these figures, uh, when, you, uh, in, uh, when you even just look at, look at the images in Buddhist art, you can feel them communicating with you. You can feel that enlightened consciousness communicating with you, sometimes inspiring you, encouraging you, sometimes challenging you. you know, sometimes the higher power uh, doesn't say all the nice, cosy things uh, that you'd like to hear. Sometimes the higher power can be you know, be a bit challenging and uh, a bit demanding. 
So we do have that in, in, in Buddhism. It's a very rich uh, part of Buddhist practice. In turn, you mentioned, Sarah, at the beginning, Buddhist philosophy. Of course, Buddhist philosophy, uh, it, 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 not that it's philosophy separated out from life, and um, it's not really philosophy in the sense that it's something thought out um, in, in a purely intellectual sense, but you do have this, uh, the, the, the Dharma, uh, taught by the Buddha, um, describing the essence of reality in terms of pratitya samapada, condition co-production, mm. that there is nothing in life that is fixed and unchanging. Everything arises in dependence upon conditions that give rise to further conditions. This is also described as shunyata, uh, emptiness, that there's nothing, as it were, anywhere that you can find that is uh, fixed and unchanging. Everything is empty of any kind of uh, uh, real self and real other. This isn't a nihilistic blank. Mm. It's nothing like that because you also find in the Heart Sutra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Now the point I'm, why, why I'm going into this is because that way of seeing things is also in relation to the higher power. Yes, it's very, very important to think that enlightenment is something vast mm. and beyond you that's in communication with you. But in the ultimate re reality, it is beyond self and beyond other. Mm. Um, it's beyond higher and lower. It's completely mm. inconceivable. Mm. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to sort of put that mm. in. There's no sort of absolute duality in, in Buddhism. We mm. can... We can become Buddhas, so we can become Bodhisattvas uh, mm -hmm. in the end. But uh, I don't see any problem at all in, mm -hmm. in you um, feeling in relation to that, that higher power mm -hmm. and, 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 and so on. And as long as, of, of course, it's, it's motivating you positively mm -hmm. um, in the direction of, of, of growth and development along the path. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Mm. So the next question is from Artaketu. Mm. Oh, Artaketu. Oh, Artaketu. Yeah. And he says, my sister lives in the UK. She is one of the people that needs to go out to work. Her partner has a lung condition, so she is afraid that she might get the coronavirus and pass it on to him. Any advice for people that are afraid of getting it and passing it on? Well, my goodness, that's a very difficult question. Um, and it would be only too easy to, you know, list off some platitudes and, uh, and so on. I think I'd just like to acknowledge that is a very difficult set of circumstances, you know, to be, to be in, you know, to be going out to work and a work that has to be done and to have, you know, a husband, a partner who, who is in that kind of condition. So I just want to acknowledge, you know, the challenge there. And, uh, you know, I, this is not the, the first, you know, time I've heard this, people having to work, particularly in hospitals and healthcare, mm. and there's concern for their loved one at home and, mm. and, and so on. So, uh, I mean, there are the very, very obvious things to do with hygiene, which I'm sure I don't need to mm. repeat, you know, but being ultra, mm. you know, careful about that. I suppose one of the things that also occurs to me, it's very, very important not to, to sort of in a sense, blame oneself if mm. anything happens. Mm. I think um, mm. providing you know you're you know you're being sensible and mm. taking precautions. This virus is is, is mm. it's it's not your fault. Mm. You know if you're in that situation, there's something going on which is uh, well, it is a sort of hidden enemy. It's a hidden uh, we, we can't see it. Mm. Uh, we can take all the precautions that we can. So if if you know, and, and I pray that, 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 you know, your sister doesn't, you know, transmit anything like that to her husband. But if that does happen, it's not her fault. Mm. So I think that's, that's very mm. important. Um, and then, of course, I think it's, it's that there has, well, in that sense, I think it's very important to have a certain kind of, well, a, a kind of acceptance and patience in relation to what's happening. Mm. Being able to forbear, to, to bear and, and to endure what's going on. I mean, Shanti 
patience is a very, very important Buddhist virtue that we we don't often um, talk about. We often talk about it in relation to somebody else's anger or something like that and not retaliating. But very often in Buddhist texts, when they talk about patience, mm. uh, when they talk about enduring and bearing, they, they mean it in relation to things like this. Mm. Uh, sickness, disease, yeah. um, the changes, the changes of the weather, um, yeah. mosquitoes, yeah. Um, which would be encountered a lot in yeah. India. Um, there's a lot to bear yeah. in in being a yeah. human being. Um, there really is, and yeah. it's interesting. The word shanti, there, there, there is an etymology of it. I don't know if it's a strict scientific one, but yeah. the one etymology is it's related to the word for the earth. Yeah. In the same way that the great earth bears everything, we have to develop a quality like the earth, which can bear and endure these very, very trying uh, conditions. There's a lot of forbearance that's going to be needed. There's, I don't know if you can see it here, Akshobhya. This, this is the Buddha of the East. He represents the immovability of enlightenment and he's touching the earth. He's calling the earth to, to witness, and, it, and it's a symbol of tremendous immovability and, and strength. Um, and it doesn't mean being all hard and uptight or something like that. It means relaxing and bearing with what is going on. And very important in the tradition, um, uh, when they talk about the practice of patience, one of the reflections you need to have in order to do this well is to be in a state of rejoicing in merit, as they call it, a state of joy. Uh, so um, in relation to your sister, yes, acknowledge this is really difficult mm. and you will have to bear it, but try to remind her of um, her joy, mm. uh, her joy in her marriage, her joy in her life. Mm. Uh, keep that alive very strongly so that in facing these things, there won't be so much anxiety and worry and fear mm, mm. Um, that there can be a bearing of it sort of lightly, as it were. Mm. Um, that's, you know, that would be perhaps the traditional answer uh, to that. But bear in mind, I'm not in that situation sure. myself. So um, I can only sort of, you know, draw on the tradition and hope that that will be mm. of help. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is from Ellie. Hello, Ellie. Hi. <laughs> uh, she says, it would be great if Padma Vajra could give us some concrete advice how to improve specifically our mindfulness of breathing and the metta bhavana. Also, it would be great if he could give some practical advice on how to improve and organize our practice as a whole. What other things we could do? Well, that's a very, very big question. Yeah. And, I, and, and just to tell you, Ellie, I'm sitting in the Pabaloka Shrine Room. One of the people listening uh, here is Satcharaja. Uh, Satcharaja, who's a, you know, a very fine um, meditation teacher, a very close friend of mine. No, she's been on retreat with Satcharaja. Oh, you know Satcharaja. And Satcharaja recently led a retreat called The Essentials of Meditation, mm -hmm. which uh, is really looking at the basics of meditation. And he's going to be... That's all going to be uploaded if oh. it's not uploaded already. So there's a lot of information that, that, and very, very practical tips that will be uploaded mm -hmm. very, very soon. So if we can, we can get you, yeah. a, uh, you can share a link with, yeah. with, with you uh, for that. So, so because it, it's a very big question that you've asked. I, I'll just confine myself. i will refer you to, to such a yeah, I'll put them, on, I'll put them yeah. on the website. Uh, that's WhatsApp that's great. Too. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but one thing I think is tremendously important, and, and perhaps it's more possible at the moment, and that is regularity. Mm. Regularity of meditation practice. Um, so getting into a rhythm where you're meditating at the same times or the same time if you're not if you're only going to do it once a day every day um, and you alternate mindfulness of breathing and metta bhavana one of the things that sangharachita once said Anti once said he thought it was very important that we associate meditation with pleasure oh. and he was very very keen to encourage 
a building up of practice. Mm. Remember one uh, lecture he gave where he was talking about meditation. He said, you know, at first, do shorter periods of meditation. Mm. Don't strain, don't put yourself under tremendous pressure, but start off with 20 minutes, Mm. Mm. gradually build up and really associate that time Mm with something mm. with, with pleasure now of course it's not always going to be pleasurable you you know that if your orientation is just to do with pleasure you'll probably stop meditating you know quite a lot of the times no you you don't do that but try to associate it with something of great interest and uh and depth and satisfaction mm. and and have regularity and like i said yesterday when i was talking about shrines Meditate in the same place, a special place Mm -hmm. that you have in your house and in your room, Um, and have have that have that have a nice shrine. Mm. Um, But get into that that regularity. But uh, but do look at this material Mm. from Mm. from the essentials of meditation retreat. That will help you a lot. Yeah, Yeah. great. Hope that helps, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, good. So we've got a question from a friend who would rather remain anonymous. Um, but he says, um, how is it possible for one who is less gifted to love in the sense of well-wishing someone who is more gifted? Doesn't jealousy or envy get in the way? Even if one has an introspectively aware nature and would not succumb to these quote-unquote evil emotions, how could one offer love in this direction without submission to the social hierarchy? Right, that's quite a question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I think that perhaps there's some assumptions in there oh. to do with the more and less gifted oh. hierarchy. Um, because, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, maybe it's, perhaps it's possible in the question that, that the question is perhaps underestimating mm. their own gifts. Mm. Um, you know, and uh, sometimes we can assume that somebody has so many more gifts than we do and we're overlooking our own gifts, our own particular, you know, contribution to things. Um, what Sangharakshita were always taught in relation to this is that you don't start out assuming that somebody is more developed than you mm. and more gifted than you and therefore you sort of, mm. as it were, bow your head to them or something like that. Mm. You start on the basis of ordinary human friendliness. Mm. That, that's, that's, that's what's really important. Even mm. if somebody, well, you feel that they're, they're more gifted than you, they're still a person. Mm. They're a human being, mm. an ordinary human being, as we're ordinary human beings. So the starting point, you know, for any communication mm. And any loving kindness is just that, mm. is just being friendly mm. and not sort of fixating, oh, they've got these qualities and I haven't got this and so on. That, that alienates us from mm. other people. Um, my experience of being around, you know, a lot of people for a long time mm. in our movement, there are, I think there are very few people, I, I would say, who are all round more developed than, mm. than, than others. I mean, there are people more developed than others, that's yeah. true, and people have qualities that, you know, we don't have and so on. But uh, I've only met a few people in my life where I think, ah, oh, this person is sort of head and shoulders, mm. Mm. you know, beyond mm. others, you know, just because they, it, it, there's something about them that, mm. that they've got that and I've got to know them quite well. My experience is that we all have something to offer. Mm. That's what I feel about our, our Sangha. You know, that our Sangha and, you know, our community, and I think that reflects the rest of the, rest of the world, everybody has a part to play in, in the enrichment of, of life. Everybody has a part, part to play. My experience is I'm strong on some things, I'm weak on other things. Friends of mine, they're strong on some things, they're weak on other things. But... The wonderful thing is we work together. Mm, mm. So there's reciprocity. And, and I think that's what you need to look for mm. in, in loving. Mm. Come with the attitude, I have something to give. Mm. I have something to offer. I'm a, I'm a human being. Mm, mm. They have something to offer. They're a human being. Mm. And, and communicate, them, communicate, to them in, it, with, with them in that, communicate with them in that way. Mm. 
Um, and and don't we don't need to think about social hierarchy mm. in that way. I don't. I think that can sort of, as it were, any sense of their being more developed or lower developed or this or that that can take care of itself. You don't. We don't need to turn that into something like a power relationship because one thing that's very important in mm. in 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 the Dharma and the Sangha, there is such a thing as a spiritual hierarchy in the mm. sense that I really believe that. You know, there are states of consciousness that are higher and some that are lower, yeah. and that there are people who inhabit those and yeah. so on. But it's not a power hierarchy. It's very, very hard to un- for us to understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, as soon as we hear that word hierarchy, we think yeah. of power. Yeah. And so, but if you approach everything through loving kindness, everybody, you meet them as in a friendly, mm-hmm. open way. Hierarchy. Mm. takes care of itself. You mm. don't even need to think about it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Great. Thank you. So I've got a question from Julia. Hello, Julia. Yeah. <laughs> she says, uh, how, to pra- how to practically meditate on our own death, smiley face with a wink <laughs> emoji. Because as I told you, uh, me, when I tried while being in Varanasi, I got very sad and I could only think of my loved ones, uh, dot, 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 a bit too depressing, dot, mm. dot, dot. Mm. Well, that's, you're not alone in that feeling of um, feeling depressed in mm. relation to meditation on death. And, you know, having lived in India myself, I, I only passed through Varanasi and didn't spend a lot of time there. But when I first went to India, um, you know, I found that, the, the, you know, awareness of death and sickness was very much in my face in a way that mm. it isn't uh, in, in this mm. country, although things have rather changed lately. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I saw my first dead bodies and, mm. and, and people dying on mm. the streets around me. And that was very, very frightening. And I had a very strong sense of death when I was in India. And it was quite traumatic and, yes, at times a bit depressing. Um, and... We're not alone with that because even in the Pali Canon, mm. uh, you get this, the, that's the, the text which record the earliest um, times of the Buddha and his, his disciples. You get this story of monks getting very, very depressed mm. by death meditation and really, really, really going downhill actually mm. um, because they'd misapplied it. It had been misapplied. Um, they, they'd sort of, they were mispracticing. They'd wrongly... They, they misinterpreted the Buddha's instructions. So if you are going to turn to death, and I guess at a time like this, mm. that is very much, we're very much aware of that. We're very much aware of serious illness and, mm. and death of so many people, including loved ones. You have to approach that very, very positively. Mm. So before you'd reflect on death, you'd always do metabhavna. Mm. meditation, lots and lots of loving kindness meditation. Um, and in the traditional set of the four, what they call the four thoughts mm. that turn the mind to the Dharma, before you come to meditate on death, you meditate on the preciousness of the human body, mm. the preciousness of the mm. human condition. You really cherish life mm. and how incredible life mm. is uh, and how important human life is and how favoured we are to have a human existence and how wonderful it is that we have all the facilities that we have and that we can, you know, especially according to Buddhist tradition, that we can enter the path to enlightenment itself. So when you men meditate on death, it's there in relation to that Mm -hmm. so that it gives you a keener appreciation of life Mm -hmm. and that life isn't to be squandered. Uh, wastefully, it, it, we need to do something with it purposefully, and a keener appreciation of our loved ones. Mm. In fact, of everybody. Mm. And there's this this famous phrase that, that had a big effect on me when I first heard it from the Dhammapada. Uh, others, um, the others being, you know, people who aren't living a, a serious life, as it were. Others do not realise that we're all heading for death. Those who do realise it will end their quarrels. Yeah, 
the wonderful insight of the Buddhas mm. that awareness of death means that you develop loving kindness because mm. that's the way you end quarreling, mm. uh, you prevent quarreling. So I think it's very important when you turn to impermanence and death, loving kindness, metta, is always associated with that Mm. and a keen appreciation of the preciousness of life. And then I think it rather changes the relationship with death because um, you see it as part of life. Mm. It's not sort of separate from life. Um, it, it's woven into the fabric of things. Mm. Um, it, it's part of, you know, the unfolding process of things. Mm. It's the expression of impermanence. And, well, impermanence is actually a good thing because if things didn't change, we wouldn't be able to mm. change and transform ourselves. So if you do start to contemplate death, if that is being, you know, you are being confronted with it, surround it with keen Mm. cherishing of life Mm. and loving kindness Mm. yeah Mm. um question from isabella hello isabella (laughs) Isabella. um she says i'm curious about his thoughts on the relationship between buddhism and shamanism and journeying into the underworld which both seem to refer back to which I'm assuming, which they both seem to refer back to journey yeah. through the underworld. Maybe she means the Buddha's journey right. into the jungle. Yes. Um, I must admit, I don't yeah. know really anything about shamanism, so yeah. I, I'm not sure I can mm. uh, really answer the question um, uh, uh, properly. I mean, I've only read a little bit uh, in it, so I'm not very uh, aware mm. of it. Um, certainly not aware of, you know, what you know, what uh, what I think they call neo shamanism. Mm. I've read a bit about si- traditional Siberian mm. uh, shaman and 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 so on. But as I understand it, that that the shaman of the tribe, you know, or of the people, mm. was that never decided to be a shaman. Oh. It was something that that happened to them, as far as I understand it, from some of my reading. And I think there are different shamanic traditions. Mm. You know, they were they were people who were rather sick or had different problems, and mm. it became very very clear that they had a calling, mm. a vocation, mm. and the way they were going to serve the community was by opening up to the world of the spirits, mm. uh, to communicate with the rest of the tribe, the rest of the community. Mm. Um, uh, that, that's that's what I've I've, I've read about it, mm. and. In a sense, I don't think there's anything really quite like that in Buddhism, although certainly in Tibetan Buddhism, you have what are known as the oracles. Mm. The, the, and the, the oracles, this seems to be related to sort of central Asian shamanism, mm. that some of these are oracles of the state. So these are monks, again, who were very sickly mm. and, you know, they have various ways of sort of working these things out. And it really, you know, they were offered, well, you'll either die young yeah. or you, you open up to these great yeah. sort of forces, yeah. these gods of the land and, and so on, who you will be the oracle for. And you, you, you get these incredible accounts of these, these yeah. monks being possessed by these uh, very powerful gods. And then, they, 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 then, then they, they're an oracle, they speak, but it's very, very cryptic and it has to be interpreted. Uh, and it's advising on what is needed in the land. And that does sort of get, as it were, incorporated into Buddhism mm-hmm. because usually well, the important thing is the interpretation of what is said by the great lamas, mm-hmm. you know, the great teachers. They then need to, and, and, and their interpretation, almost inevitably, as far as I understand it, mm. is always in accordance with, with Buddhist practice. Mm. So if you're having some sort of, you know, vision or advice mm. in the underworld, as you mm. call it, or in that other place, that realm of the spirits, if you're on the Buddhist path, you have to interpret that in terms of Buddhist practice. Mm. You know, sometimes, you know, I, I heard a story and I've got no way of tracking this down, that the, when the Chinese invaded Tibet, mm. 
um, they were convinced, the, the Tibetans being very devoted Buddhists, that their tantric rituals would avert the invasion. It would, it would push them back with these very powerful tantric rituals. Mm-hmm. And they were very puzzled as to why that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. And apparently the Dalai Lama asked the oracle, the state oracle, why did this fail? And, the, and, the, and what came back was the way in which the regent before the Dalai Lama was murdered. In other words, because of factionalism within mm. Tibetan Buddhism mm. and what, what Tibetan politics, mm. the land was impure. Mm. Uh, so it points, you know, that interpretation then points to the need for great purification mm. of ethical behavior and so on and mm. so forth. Mm. So I don't know what that means in mm. terms of you know our, our 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 practice now, but I, I think if you do if you if you are somebody who has you know visions and dreams and goes on sort of underworld trip journeys, it's very if you're practicing the Dharma, you need to read all that in the light of the Dharma. Mm. Um, you know the that that's what's going to be very very important. Um, any of these things that, that, that you do, you, you interpret in the light of fundamental Buddhist ethics and, and practice. Yeah. So I don't know if that helps, as, 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 as you mm. can probably see. I, I, I'm a little bit in the dark here. But, although, yeah, yeah, although I remember coming on a retreat here before, and mm. I'm, I think I'm right in saying that you, you said the Buddha was referred to sometimes as the great shaman. Oh, when, when I heard that, I found that really inspiring. Oh, you can have a kind of clean vision of this character. Yes, yes. And this, yeah. this, this kind of wild yeah. character. I've well, it's, really it, I'll, I'll say a, a bit about that. This, this is, I should just say that this is, this is something that Sangharachita saw. Mm. This, this comes from his seminars on the Udana. Mm. The Udana being a collection of very old, very early mm. Uh, Buddhist material, and what he is, what he's getting at is that in the first suttas, the first discourses of this text, uh, it describes the Buddha just after his enlightenment. Mm. Oh. He is enjoying mm. for seven days, unmoving the bliss of liberation, the bliss mm. of release, and he's reflecting on, you know, the Dharma that he's discovered. Mm. And at the end of each of these different uh, short suttas, which are very rich. He, he refers to um, the man um, who's gone beyond, who's seen things as they are, and who's uh, discovered the way things are as being a Brahmin. Now, the word Brahmin has a caste meaning. Mm. That's the predominant meaning, is the dominant meaning. Mm. meaning. And there's different re- there's different theories about why the Buddha used this language. He's mm. trying to find a word that people know to describe the enlightened person. Mm. He doesn't come himself come from the Brahmin caste, doesn't believe in caste. So he's he's trying to describe, as it were, the highest person mm. in terms that people use, and he's trying to redefine the word Brahmin. Mm. So it doesn't mean something caste based. It's the person who's gone beyond, this person who has, as it were, superior knowledge, hidden knowledge. Mm. And Sangharachita wondered if the Buddha had in mind a much more archaic use of the word Brahmin, mm. which was much more like the shaman of the tribe, mm. the shaman of the invading tribes that came to India. Mm. So that's why he said it's as if the Buddha is like a shaman, the enlightened person is like a shaman. It's not, not a shaman, yeah. but like a shaman. There's an analogy because mm. what the Buddha is doing, he's gone out alone into the jungle. Mm. That's apparently what shamans do mm. traditionally. They go out alone, they fast and mm. all that kind of thing. The Buddha has gone out, mm. you know, to, or before his enlightenment, he's gone out to discover mm. this ultimate uh, way of seeing things. Mm. And there is some, something ecstatic in that because he says he enjoys the bliss of liberation and he returns to teach, not about how the tribe should organize itself mm-hmm. or anything like that, mm-hmm. but with the profound principles of enlightenment and practice mm-hmm. that everybody can use mm-hmm. that's universal in mm-hmm. that way. Mm-hmm. So he's using it, it it's analogous, mm-hmm. if you like. Mm-hmm. He's not saying 
the Buddha is a shaman, mm, mm. he's saying it's analogous to the way the shaman is in mm. relation to the tribe. Do you see yeah. what I mean? Yeah. 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 yeah, that's great. Um, hmm. So we've got a question from Surya Jinnah. Hello, Surya Jinnah. Surya Jinnah. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, he says, is corona a sign of the universe? Is the message that civilization is too dense slash tight, too fast, too overheated? Question mark. Do we run in a certain direction where we have no future anymore? And can we invent slash transform ourselves from ego to eco system according to, according to the Dharma? Is this the right time now to usher in a new epoch of solidarity and Buddhahood? Well, that's quite a question. Of course, <laughs> it's always the right time to usher in a new yeah. epoch of solidarity and Buddhahood. And, you know, there's, there's never a... Mm. There's all, it's always a right time. Mm. Hopefully, this kind of crisis will make people more aware mm. of, um, you know, of the need to behave differently and, mm. and to, have, to, to, to act with, with, with greater solidarity in relation to one another. Of course... It isn't the first time in human life that that um, that, 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 that there's been a pandemic. Mm. You know, there have been in 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 the past. Mm. You know, infections and and so on that have spread through society, that have spread through the world. I mean, you know, all ever. You know, it's to do with mm. you know being uh, having this body in this world. There are diseases. There are viruses and so on. You know, it. it goes with the it goes with this it's woven into life um, with increased globalization and 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 so on and probably overpopulation and all the rest of it it becomes more you know it becomes more widespread you know I mean that that's that 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 that's the truth of things but just even if we changed everything mm. so that we live differently we'd still be subject to viruses. Mm. We'd still be subject to disease. That won't, mm. that won't go away because it's woven into mm. this kind of life that we lead. Mm. Um, but, um, well, let's, let all, all we can do, I think, as, as, as Buddhists is, um, you know, really uh, bring out particularly this, this, this strong sense. I think the most important uh, right now, what I'm thinking, because I can't think in terms of how to organise the world or, yeah. or the country. I mean, it's hard enough even thinking about how we organise ourselves at Padmaloka. You know, we do our best in our little ecosystem. Yeah. Um, but the most important thing I get from this is actions have consequences. Mm. You know, what we do has an effect. Mm. And the most important thing that, 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 that we need to pay attention to is what we do influences our world and our environment. Mm. And we need to be as meticulous as we can be about that. Mm. Um, yeah, so actions have consequences. Mm. And, um, you know, perhaps people will sort of wake up to that more strongly. Mm. Um, you know, hopefully there'll, there'll be a stronger appreciation of other people. And, and life itself coming out of this and the need for greater care and attention mm. of one another. But we'll still be fighting things, and, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, even if, like I say, even if we sort of change things and, mm. and, and, and make things more environmentally friendly, more conscious, you know, in that way, more aware of the ecology mm. of things, there will still be disease, mm. there will still be illness, there will still be death. Mm. You know that that is part of the nature of things, and uh, we need to kind of develop a, a, a um, an awareness that understands that that is the nature of things, and we need to live a life that uh, is meaningful in relation to that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, great. So we're coming towards the end. Um, so a question from Porwanto. Hello, Porwanto. Yeah. Uh, he says, I want to ask about how one does dana correctly, because when I do dana, I always wonder whether I do it correctly or wrongly. Thank you, <laughs> smiley face. <laughs> there's, uh, 
it's a while since I've looked up these things, but there is a traditional, you know, you know Buddhism is very good on its analysis of, um, you know, negative states, positive states, uh, skillful action. And there's a whole list of things to do with, you know, generosity. Mm. You know, the th different things that, that you give, I mean, material things, giving money, mm. um, giving time, giving energy, um, giving fearlessness. We talked about that yesterday. Mm. Uh, giving people that that's a gift giving people the Dharma that's said to be the highest gift mm -hmm. of all giving people the means to transform themselves um, that's even superior to giving life and limb which is quite something because that is the hardest thing mm -hmm. to give you know being prepared to give your life not recklessly um, mm -hmm. it's never recommended to do that recklessly but uh, so you get this list of, of, of things to give and of course who do you give to mm -hmm. You give to those in need. Um, you give you you give to those who who are, are really doing something. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis in in Buddhist tradition that you give to those who are really practicing the Dharma. Um, you know, for the benefit of others, so that uh, the world is enriched in that way. And there's lots of things you can give to support that. You give to the sick. Uh, you give to your loved ones. Don't forget them. You know, we have a saying in English: charity begins at home. Mm. You know, sometimes we can be giving all over the place and forgetting the needs of the people, mm. you know, right next to us. And it's said that uh, um, in terms of how you give, uh, you give with a pure motivation. You know, you give not to get anything back. Mm. Uh, you give open-handedly, in other words, so that you, you know, you're not concerned to give in in with with in a way to kind of. Um, you know, to have so that people are going to give you something back or you can have a special influence. Mm -hmm. you, know, you give open handedly, you give quickly. If you see the need, mm -hmm. you give quickly. You don't wait around wondering because you can argue yourself out mm -hmm. of, of giving in that way. And you give without regret. That's very important. That having given, you don't then start thinking, well, I'm not, I shouldn't have given that away. No, you give without any regrets because mm -hmm. the act of giving is such a positive thing. Ultimately, and uh, this is what they call the perfection of giving, mm. uh, you give without any self-consciousness, no negative self-consciousness about the giver, mm. the person given to, and the gift itself. This is called the Trimandala Parishuddha, mm. the threefold circle of purity. Mm. Um, so giving then is just a flow. Mm. without any self-consciousness. That's what you're looking for. That's the Bodhisattva's giving. Mm. You know, there's no sort of sense of self, other, and what's between. There's just this flow. Whatever you have, mm. you, 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 you make it available to others. Mm. Uh, so there's this flow of, of, of generosity. And, you know, reaching this sort of level of giving is a process. Mm. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm thinking of giving this, but I doubt my motivation. I think it's better to give yeah. and purify your motivation in that journey of, of giving because the other person will benefit from what you give. Yeah. They will be enriched yeah. uh, by it. Yeah. Another uh, important aspect of giving is you give courteously. Mm. You know, you don't come as a, here's this, you know, you give it, with with grace mm -hmm. and courtesy and with full awareness of of the other person, mm -hmm. um, in the end, the bodhisattva. Uh, this is the, the the person who is dedicated to enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. Mm -hmm. They just give their entire life and everything they have for the enrichment of all others mm -hmm. and for the enlightenment of all others. That's the ultimate giving. Your life. You know, your life is sort of, you've decided that your life is going to be dedicated for the, for, mm. for the well-being of others. Yeah. That is the way you, you see, it's the only way you feel that you can grow and develop living like that. Mm. Not with any strain, it's something very natural and very relaxed. Mm. And, uh, well, it makes, and, and there's a feeling of great satisfaction in that. Mm. Uh, so that's, yeah, some thoughts mm. on giving. I hope that's mm. helpful. Mm. Yeah. I was thinking is what one of the things that I, I, one of the positive things at the moment that I feel is like so many people actually just 
it's almost like a big opportunity for people to give. Yes. You know, in society in general these days, yeah. in so many ways. Yeah. Because probably because we have such a well articulated mm. system, if you want to call mm. it that, where things sort of work, it's like people mm. can actually give something in a straightforward yes. way. Yeah. And so it probably kind of human has a kind of humanizing effect. Yes. On people, so. Well, it's very noticeable here that a lot of people are volunteering. Yeah. Coming, you know, doctors and so on coming out of retirement, yeah. you know, yeah. to help the National Health Service, um, you know, people volunteering for the army yeah. to help and so on. Uh, you know, people just really wanting to help mm. other people. I mean, That's it's great. very, very moving yeah. and inspiring to hear that, mm. you know, that there, there is so much goodness in human mm. nature. Yeah. And this, you know, this is an opportunity to, to really contribute to that. Mm. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so I think this is our last mm. question from Elska. Hello, Elska. Hello, Elska. Um, she says, Dear Padma Vajra, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to answer our questions. I truly appreciate it. Here is mine, smiley face. Uh, connecting with others is a basic human need. I, re I recently realized how hard it is to do without putting my own expectation neediness and projections into that space of interaction, for lack of a better word. It often feels very overloaded by conditioning and unfree. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you have any experience in how to create a more open space between yourself and another person where you meet a little more as equals, free of expectation, neediness, projections? Thanks ever so much, Elska. Mm -hmm. Well, it's sort of inevitable that we approach people from, mm. you know, our side, yeah. you know, with all of our uh, conditionings and so on. I, I, I think it's uh, inevitable that we'll, we'll do that. Mm. Um, and we do need to be really connected with people. I was saying mm. yesterday, we're profoundly social yeah. beings, you know, mm. and we need to be with people. And uh, we also need love. I mean, I think, you know, it's pretty clear that... Uh, human beings grow and flourish through, mm. through love and encouragement. Um, you know, and if we, if we don't get that, it's very hard for us to, you know, to grow and change. But the, but the strange thing is, uh, or perhaps sometimes the, the, the slightly irritating thing is, you know, we can feel that we need that love and encouragement, mm. but we go about trying to get it in entirely the wrong way, mm. uh, with a sort of demand, with an expectation, mm. Um, with a craving and attachment. And of course, it just puts too much pressure on the other mm. person and they, they feel unfree themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, they're averse. They don't yeah. want to respond in that way. So we have to start again. Mm. Uh, there's this lovely saying, if you, want to, if you want to have a friend, you have to be a friend. Mm. And being a friend means being a friend without having any expectation of friendship. Mm. Um, and this is where I think metabhavna and human friendliness mm. um, and helpfulness and generosity comes in. Mm. And think more in terms of, if you like, your own friendliness and your own generosity and kindness is its own reward. Mm. This is really, really important. If mm. we're thinking of another reward mm. that this other person mm. is going to love us, mm. it won't come. Yeah. We have to think, no. Being friendly, being kind, being helpful consistently, that is the reward. Mm. Um, and it is, it's true. Yeah. There is something wonderfully pleasurable about that approach yeah. to life, uh, if you can get into it. Yeah. Um, and what then starts to happen, slowly, slowly, yeah. is that you start noticing that you do have some friends. That you that there are people who who, who want to be with you and uh, and you start feeling enriched by them. Mm. As soon as you then put a demand on or an expectation, it goes. Mm. So there's there there is this there is this sort of um, um, you know it's very hard for us I think sometimes to conceive of a very strongly positive emotion mm. or a strong emotion which doesn't have that grasping in it. So do you, do you think you need a yeah. level of sort of self 
don't know if this is the right way to say it, but a level of self-sufficiency uh, resort. Do you know what I mean? So you're kind of, you're not trying to get everything from someone else, well, but something a, to give them, even like the last question. Well, so in, a, in a sense, you have to be a friend yeah. to yourself. Yeah. You know, before you can, in, in a sense, if you're not a friend to yourself, it's very hard to have friends. Mm. You know, you have to be able to sort of, um, you know, this is what we're doing in the first stage of the metabarbana, we're befriending ourselves, mm. you know, and uh, if we can befriend ourselves, it's much more easy to befriend mm. others and for mm. others to befriend us because mm. there won't be that pressure mm. uh, on other people. So we have to do some, we have mm. to do a bit of work you know, on ourselves to do that. And and friendship is is a very, very it's a very rare thing. I think that's mm. another thing that I, I think it's worth pointing out, mm. Elska. We assume that everybody has friends and I'm mm. I'm the one who doesn't. Mm. Real friendship is a very rare thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, friendship isn't like mm. I remember Sangarachta saying here on the seminar, he said, um, falling in love is like growing flowers. They grow, it's very bright, and they grow very quickly, but they fade very quickly. Mm. Forming a friendship is like growing an oak tree. Mm. You have a little acorn. It takes a long time to grow, but it's very, very hard to uproot that tree. Mm. Mm. You know, even when it's a little sapling, mm. you have to make quite a lot of effort to get, to get rid of it. Yeah. So we can't be impatient with, with mm. friendship. It's something that, that grows slowly over time. Um, you know, and uh, it's very important. And it's not, you know, I'm talking about a non-sexual, non-clinging, you know, kind of friendship. That's that 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 sort of thing. It seems, in a way, very quiet, um, sort of unsensational, but it's 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 very profound in the end. Um, you know, the great Christian uh, monk, Cistercian monk, uh, English Cistercian, Elred de Brivo has this beautiful um, saying that uh, a friend, a really good friend is like another self. Mm. That's a really wonderful insight into friendship because when you're with a really good friend, mm. you're, they're like, they're you and not you. Mm. You, you know, they're, they're, you're, you're so close, you can talk about anything, but because they're not you, mm-hmm. they have a perspective on what you're saying that mm. you don't have. That's great. So, that perhaps gives us a bit of a clue to what we're looking for in the mm. development of friendship, that mm. kind of intimacy. Start by, by really having a, a, you know, being a good friend to yourself. Mm. Maybe going back to the, the, the question about higher power and what I said earlier, yeah. internalise your own friend. Mm. You know, and mm. um, it does seem to be a thing. A lot of people seem to find... You know, they have a lot of trouble with themselves, a lot of dislike mm. and loathing and all that sort of thing. Well, you know, you, 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 you have to fight against that. You have to, um, you have to sort of almost visualise and imagine, you know, the friend uh, inside you that doesn't look at you in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, you know, you, you, friendship is its own, befriending is its own reward. Mm. Um, so in a way, it's not really an answer about what you do, um, but perhaps it is. Yeah, it was for me. Yeah, good. <laughs> I liked good. it. I hope that's help- helpful, Oscar. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's the last of our questions from uh, guys in Berlin. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for doing this. It's, it's a great pleasure. I think I'm sure it's yeah. been helpful. For everyone in Berlin, but it's also been it's it's been really helpful for me the past few days and Great. really enjoyed Great. it. So thank you very much. I look forward to when you come over to Berlin. Yes, yeah, yeah. in the real real world. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Great to be in touch with you all. Thank yeah. you. And maybe we'll do something else with Berlin for in the sure. Coming, coming yeah. weeks or months. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you.